Good morning. Wow. Hello. Here it is. It is great to be with you again today. And go ahead and take out your bulletin. I have a lot of, uh, of announcements that are not in your bulletin. So if you need to write these down, please do so. Um, the first is starting October 11th, we are going, that's a Wednesday at 6.30, not our typical 7 o'clock. We are going to begin a pilot class on the money challenge. Um, money is something that every single one of us has or doesn't have, <laughs> needs, and we have to figure out how do we use it, how do we steward it well. And, and uh, this is a book that we're going to be going through. We're going to try to cultivate it so that we get an idea of how to make it a meaningful class, how it can be helpful. We'll have some testimonies and whatnot. But handling money is an issue that can often cause a lot of struggles in marriages, in your home. Um, how do you navigate inflation? How do you learn about retirement, about saving, about budgets, all that stuff? And uh, I just, I was blessed when I was um, 19 years old. I was sitting in college in a class, and a guy came in and he goes, Guys, I want you to tell you, most preachers who are retiring today weren't planning on retiring when they were your age. And he's like, Just a, a small amount of saving now grows. If you're able to save right now, it grows and uh, it can help you a lot later on in life. And so I just, I've grown to um, appreciate some of the wisdom that he gave me. And so I'll be leading that class. It will be 6.30 to 7.30. One of the things though, I want to see this as an opportunity for um, outreach to our town. And so we have 20 books in the back there on the ground. If you would like one, they're five bucks. You can just drop that in the offering plate if you want, but they're five bucks. And if you know someone in town, you're just like, hey, this is a great opportunity. Come learn about how to handle money from God's perspective. But what that means is we need child care. <laughs> because if a parent wants to come in and learn about money and they have kids, I can tell you from personal experience, it is hard to focus with all your kids there sometimes. And so we, I'd love to have this as an opportunity from our church to say, hey, we're going to love our town. We're going to provide child care. We want two adults each night from 630 to 730. And the class will probably take a total of 13 weeks. We'll take December off. But if you can just sign up for at least one time, begin talking to me. And if you want to come to this class, let me know so I can kind of get an idea for a head count if we're going to have one person or 10 or 20, um, just to make sure we have enough books. But they're in the, they're out there, not out there, right in the back. I can see the box, five bucks, and um, I encourage you to come to that. Also, we are starting up small group, or we are going to be dividing small groups on October 8th. We'll have three small groups. Two will meet on Sunday night, and one will meet on Monday in Osage. And so if you are not currently in a small group and would like to be, please tell me, let me know, and I'll get you situated in that. Those of you who are in a small group, uh, there's going to be some shuffling around. We want to make sure the whole church knows each other. We don't want to build cliques. We want you to build friendships, and you'll be naturally more friendly with some people in church than others, but we don't want cliques. That's not helpful in any church, and uh, we don't want to do that. But the, the names will come out in this week's email, so if you're not signed up for the email, uh, let me know, and I will get you signed up for that email. Also, um, we have some free books that are in my office. Not all of the books in my office are free, okay? Listen very carefully here. If you see the name Warren W. Wiersbe, it is not free. <laughs> no, uh, there, there are bookshelves right on the inside of my office, kind of six shelves there. Anything on those shelves is free if you're interested. Um, yes, not the tools. Excuse me. Not the tools. Books are free. Um, and then if you need a bookshelf, we have a couple of bookshelves that we've emptied in the basement that we can give to you. Look down there at the next steps of faith. We, I desire that you be growing and that you be progressing in your faith. One of the things to do is serving. And uh, we are now redoing a nursery so that we have two nurseries in the basement. So if you like painting or would be interested in serving the church by painting, please talk to Emily. She's my wife in the back. Raise her hand. Uh, if you're interested in painting, talk to her. Before we go to prayer, I want you to know that a growing church is a sending church. And I want you to say that with me. A growing church is a sending church. Today, 
Isaiah is preaching in Flores, Iowa. Troy Rice right now is preaching over in Osage, Iowa. And we have the privilege of having Andy Hecker here today. He is a college student at Faith Baptist Bible College, seeking God's calling into the ministry, seeing if that's what God wants for him. He's studying to go into ministry, and he'll be preaching this Sunday as well. I'll be back again next week for preaching. But it's our joy to let them experience and learn how to preach the Word of God. And I'm thankful for this church, thankful for the patience that you have demonstrated, and even the, the willingness to have younger voices. We've had Jared preach before. And so I want to say thank you for that. Um, there is a huge shortage of pastors in the world. It's not just in Baptist denominations, in the world. And so let's, let's pray that God sends people from our church into the ministry. But no... That means you might lose someone you love that goes to this church. But that's a good, th good thing because a growing church is a sending church. Uh, for prayer, you may have heard, but Danielle uh, Fonte, is that how you pronounce her name? Danielle Fonte is someone who this Friday died in a car wreck from this area. Um, she was driving with her two kids, a 9 and 11-year-old, and got in a wreck and was killed almost instantly. The child, one of the children, had to call 911 and let them know where they were and what was going on. And so I want to pray for her. Um, Casey's is doing what they can to help and support her. Uh, there's been some donations that have been made for her. I don't know all the information, um, but let's pray for her, and we might see in, as we come up if there's not something we can do for her as a church. So let's pray for her, give this service to the Lord, and then sing together. Father God, we are thankful to be a part of St. Ansgar. And um, I know I love this town. And uh, there's suffering going on right now for the fami family of Danielle. And I just pray that you would uh, allow Christians to come alongside her and encourage her, that our town would be a good support for her, that you'd be with um, the person who hit her and the weight that goes along with that. I pray also for her family as they suffer this loss. And in just a couple of weeks, there will be, you know, there's going to be a funeral, and everyone else's life kind of seems to go back to normal while the family continues to live with what feels like a hole in their life. And we've had a couple of surprising deaths here, even in our town. I pray that we would be able to be a light and a help and an encouragement, that we would show the love of Christ to them. And Lord, today, even as we listen to your word, may we look at and learn about what it looks like to live like and to show Christ to others, those in our town, those who are suffering, those who are doing well, and to each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we start our singing. First song as we're going to start singing is Only a Holy God. We'll sing all four verses. commands all the hosts of heaven who else can make every knee bow down who else can whisper and darkness tremble only a holy God come and behold him the one and the only cry out sing holy Forever a holy God, come and worship the holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor inclines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God, come and the holy God. What other glory consumes like fire? What 
other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. Who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy forever. Worship the Holy God. Good seeing you can be seated. At this time, we'll have a reflection time from Proverbs chapter 3. Thank you, Hannah. Let's stand together again and we'll sing, O Great God of Highest Heaven. We'll sing three verses of the song. O Great God of Highest Heaven, occupy my lowly it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or sin remain that resists your holy war. You have loved and purchased me, make me yours forevermore. I was blinded by my sin. Had no ears to hear your voice. 
did not know your love within had no taste for heaven's joys then your spirit gave me life opened up your word to me through the gospel of your son gave me endless hope and peace help me now to live a life that's dependent on your grace keep my heart and guard my soul from the evils that i face you are worthy to be praised with my every thought and need oh great god of highest heaven glorify your name through me great singing you could be seated we'll have our offertory at this time if our men will come forward. God, what a beautiful day it is to be in your house worshiping you. You are a God who is worthy to be praised. And we thank you for the opportunity to do that. And it's the simple way of praising you is giving back what you've given to us. I pray that we would give it out of a heart of cheerfulness and a heart of joyfulness of understanding that what you've given to us is yours. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Romans chapter 15, we'll read the first six verses and then we'll sing our next two songs. <clears throat> Romans 15, 1 through 6. We then, who are strong, ought to bear with the 
scopes of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now stand together and sing as the deer. Mm-hmm. And then we'll sing come people of the risen king as the deer. Yes. So my soul longeth after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit. To worship me, you're my friend and you are my brother, even though you are a king. I love you more than any other, so much more than any spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. Acapella. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee. Wonderful singing. Our last song before Andy comes. Come people of the risen king. Come people of the risen king who delight to bring him From the shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to Him. Where steady arms of mercy reach to gather children in. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. Church of Christ, rejoice. Come, those whose joy is morning sun, and those weeping through the night. Come, those who tell of battles won, and those struggling in 
the fight for his perfect love will never change and his mercies never cease but follow us through all our days in the certain hope of peace rejoice rejoice let every tongue rejoice one heart one voice O church of christ rejoice come young and old from every land men and women of the faith come roses for empty hands and the riches of his grace over all the world his people sing shore to shore we hear them call the truth that christ through every age our God is all in all. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, rejoice. Good singing, you can be seated. Children, you can be dismissed to Children's Church. Andy, and come give us the word. All right, good morning. It's a little different view up here than I have most Sunday mornings, but we'll make the best of it. All right, so if you will, open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. It's where we'll be at this morning. And... I've entitled titled the message, Be Examples of Christ. So, let's, if you're in Romans 15, 1 through 6 here, let's read the passage. The Bible says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. And through endurance and through encouragement of the scripture, we might have hope. May the, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, Jesus, that together, Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's dedicate this time to the Lord. Dear Lord, we come to you now and we thank you for the opportunity you have given me to preach your word and just the joy it is to study your word. And I pray for the people here, that all of us, that we would be challenged by your truth. And I pray that you would help me to say what you want me to say and that your spirit would work through me and that we would be able to have a little bit different point of view of scripture and what it teaches us going away from here this morning in jesus name amen so the book of romans i feel like is one of the more popular books in the new testament i mean you hear a lot about it and the Apostle Paul, which wrote over half, about half the books in the New Testament, is the one who wrote it. The book of Romans was written by Paul to the churches in Rome. Even though Paul had never been to Rome, he heard about all the churches in Rome that were started by other believers. And Paul heard good reports from them, as you can, we can see if we look in Romans 16, about all the like 30-some people that Paul greets. In the book, uh, the book is about right, the righteousness of God, and help them become, and the, help become righteous like Christ. In the first eleven chapters of Romans, Paul writes about how God has revealed His righteousness to believers, 
and why the good news needs to be proclaimed. In chapters 12 through 16, Paul tells us how we should respond to God's righteousness that should be living inside our hearts as we strive to become mediators of Christ. Some people call the last five chapters of Romans the user-friendly chapters of instruction for everyday spirit-led life. So look with me at the 15th chapter in Romans where we will start reading in verse 1. And we'll read, we'll read verses 1 and 2 again here. And the Bible says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves, but each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. So my challenge to you guys today, as we get started, is how are you showing Christ by the way you did live your day-to-day -day life? And if Christ were here with us, would you change anything about the way you are living? And from this passage, I, want, I think there are four good principles we can learn from this passage that will help us become better examples of Christ. And our first principle we find here is in verses 1 and 2. And that is, we need to show Christ by encouraging our weaker brothers. As I was studying this, I was reading, and we read verse 1, it says, We who are strong have an obligation. Now, what does obligation mean? What does that mean in this passage? So I looked the word obligation up, and it means an act of course, an act or a course of action to which a person is morally or legally bound in duty or commitment. So this verse literally is saying it is our duty to carry the burdens of our weaker fellow believers. And when we're reading this passage, we see failings of the weak. This is talking about people who are, you could say, less, they're younger in their walk with the Lord as they're growing spiritually. They, maybe they just got saved in the past week or year, or maybe they they were saved as a child, but their upbringing, they never really had an opportunity to grow and to become a strong, um, growing Christian. But here, Paul is saying, we need to take what we have learned, the strength that we have in God as we've grown, and we need to help pick up the younger believers. I think of... Um, like when you have a baby, at first, when that baby is born, it can't do anything on its own. You have to carry it. You have to do everything for it. But as it gets older, it can start doing more on its own. And by the time it's a teenager or in their 20s, they are, they are almost totally dependent and don't need their parents or their spiritual leaders anymore. Yeah, so they think. But the Bible says that we do this not to please ourselves or so people would look at us, but to do this to please our neighbors. And our neighbors are anyone who we run into. We are to do this to show others the love of Christ. But this is what Jesus would do for the weaker brother. We are also to do this to help our weaker fellow believers to grow closer to Jesus themselves. And I think, and in coming here in chapter 15, as I was studying this, these first seven verses, they don't really feel like they belong there if you study Romans. Because this is basically a summary of all of chapter 14. And chapter 14 of Romans is talking about how we should be living together with other believers. So if we are not living in the ways that bring God glory to God, we need to think about what we are doing and about all the people who are watching how we live and basing their view of Christians off the way we live our everyday lives. We are always being watched and people are waiting to see how we respond. So respond in a way that will bring glory to God and not you. 
It is God who deserves all the glory, honor, and praise. And I never really thought about that much growing up, how um, people are watching you. In the high school years, I was working at this farm, on a neighbor's farm, and they had a boy who he's uh, six years younger than me. And he would watch everything I would do. And then, like, a couple weeks later, I would see him do something, and I would be like, I did that exact same thing. And it got to the point over the um, summer and over the years, because I still helped them out whenever I could or whenever they needed help, that a lot of times he would listen to me or have more respect for me than he even would for his own parents, which was not a good thing. <laughs> but just seeing how much impact we have on people and what they see and what they are learning just from watching the way we live. Now let's turn our attention to verse 3, which tells us about someone who is an example of how we glorify God in everyday life. In verse 3, we find our second principle I want to talk about, where we need to show Christ by learning from Christ's example. Verse 3 says, for Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. The first thing we learn from Christ's example is we are not to do things to please ourselves, but to help others glorify God. The second thing we can learn from Christ's example is we need to look back at history and learn from it. So we don't repeat it and make the same mistakes that people of old or people in the past have made. I think of the time when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the desert after 40 years of fat, uh, 40 days of fasting, not 40 years. <laughs> but what did Jesus do in that time? Satan came to him and he said, "If you bow down and worship me, you can." Our you sh why don't you make these rocks into bread and eat? Because you haven't eaten for 40 days. But what did Jesus do? He quoted scripture from the book of Deuteronomy because he knew the value of the learning from the past, learning from history. And the Bible said, and I think that, um, and we can learn to define defend ourselves with past scripture as we study scripture. And this is another reason that just emphasizes why we need to be memorizing and hiding God's word in our heart. Because we never know when someone's going to come tempt us. As Jared shared in Sunday school this morning about how this guy came up to him at the volleyball games and was asking him questions about faith. We need to have scripture in our hearts so when situations like that come to us, we can be ready to give an answer, as the Bible says in 1 Peter. The Bible says in the second part of this verse that the reproaches of those who reproach you fall on me. Now, if you were like me, when you first read this phrase, you were thinking, what in the world does reproach mean? Because that is a word we... I've never heard anyone use. But I was, so I was looking it up and studying it, and it says the word reproach could be um, replaced with the word insult. And it comes from a verse in Psalm 69. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Psalm 69 with me, we'll read verse, Psalm 69, verse 9. Psalm 69, 9. The Bible says, For zeal for your hosts has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Now, if we read this Psalms, we get understand that the person who wrote this Psalm was standing up for God's word and the work in God's house. And all the people of Israel and the people surrounding him were 
making fun of him or mocking him for standing up for what was right. And really, he's crying out to God in this psalm. God, I'm doing what you asked me to do. I'm trying to live my life for you. But I'm getting stabbed or I'm getting... People are talking bad about me or cutting me down everywhere I go. And it was just becoming too much for him. And sometimes in life, standing up for God is going to cost us. It's not easy. But we know from other passages of Scripture that it will always be worth it in the end. Because we get to go to heaven where then people who are making fun of us, that might not be the In the, this psalm, the psalmist was being falsely accused and is because he was living pure and right. No matter what we do as believers, people are always going to question, criticize, and talk bad about us. But let them talk, because if we are living a life that brings glory to God, we have God on our side. And he will make sure that the haters bad deeds will de de be dealt with and made right through re repentance or judgment. Uh, a verse in the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. You think of that, and so easy when we're trapped in sin, we think, well, this, is, this isn't really anything. It's just something small. No one's ever going to find out about this. But yet we read the Old Testament, and time after time after time, God judged the person who was in sin. God judged the children of Israel because of their sin. There's no escaping God's judgment. Either we go to him and repent, or he comes to us with judgment. And in the same Psalms, a few verses later in verse 33, the Bible says, For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. This verse is really comforting when I was studying it because no matter where we are, no matter what's happening to us, God is with us, even if we're in prison. I mean, you think of, again, going back to history, and you think of all the great things that were done. I mean, how many times was Paul in prison? Or John or the book Pilgrim's Progress, which was written by John Bunyan when he was in prison. And just how, no matter where we are in life, no matter where life takes us, God can use that for his glory. Whether it's in prison or at your job, in church, school, wherever it is, God can use that, and God wants to use that if you are willing to give that to him. So now let's look at verse 4, where we see our third principle, which is we need to show Christ by learning from history. And verse 4 says, back in Romans 15, it says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. And through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scripture, we might have hope. And I'm thinking about this, we have all probably heard the saying, make sure you know your history because history always repeats itself. And I touched on this earlier, but again, Paul emphasizes that here in verse 4. Now, most people probably learn this lesson from studying world history or Old Testament history and seeing how it was like the people of old only did three things. Turn to God, fall back into problems, and fight wars to settle those problems. But if you're like me, this truth became real to you when you didn't do what you were told. Got spanked for it, and then got spanked again because you still didn't learn. <laughs> I know that's hard for you guys to believe because, I mean, I'm I'm him. I'm pretty much perfect now. <laughs> okay, that's not true. But, but, it was not a, but I was not a very good child. And 
Uh, if you went and asked my dad, he could probably tell you more than you want to know. It seemed like I got in trouble every day, and half the time I didn't even know why I was in trouble, I felt like. But when we're looking at this, we need to learn from the past. History always repeats itself. I mean, all we have to do is look where our country is going now today. And it is looking a lot like times of history where people just doing their own thing doing what they think is best and not basing it off principles of life or principles of scripture. And it's just scary to think about because who knows what's going to happen. But here in this passage we are talking about something greater than disciplining a child or world history. We are talking about people's lives who will be changed for eternity by the way we act or respond to others. And let's look at the end of this, uh, verse 4b again, where it says, Through endurance and through encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope. And this thinking about this encouragement, what are we doing to encourage the believers around us? Are we just kind of standing back and watching them and saying, uh, you'll figure it out. You can learn for yourself. Are we coming alongside them and saying, hey, I, I was in your shoes. I was at this stage in life. And I tried this and what you're doing, and that's so why don't you avoid that? Go a different way. And you hear so many times how someone's life is changed by someone else who came alongside of them and actually cared about them and showed that they cared by helping them. And it can be something very simple. Uh, conversation, a phone call, a text message, or it can be something more serious like taking a Saturday and going to help them with a project or whatever it is. But we have no idea how the little bit of time we take for others could influence people. And there's, uh, to illustrate this, there's, I found this, um, short story, I guess, if you will. It says, there is a man who went to church, and in the middle of the sermon, his phone started ringing because he forgot to shut the silencer off. The pastor stopped and scolded him from, for being so careless and disrespectful. When the service was over, all the people in the church said similar things to him as they walked by him as they left to go home. On the way home, the man's wife scolded him and yelled at him for being so careless and being so dumb to do such a thing. Later that day, the man was so discouraged and depressed that he went to a bar and ordered a drink. Still, being nervous, he spilled the, he spilled the drink all over the counter and the floor. He was about to leave because he was expecting a lot of the same attitudes and remarks from the people at the bar. But to his surprise, nobody said a word to him. In fact, the bartender just grabbed a towel and cleaned up the mess. And another person saw it and felt bad because he spilled his drink and offered to buy him another one. That man goes to that bar all the time and has a lot of friends there. And he has never stepped foot into the church again. Moral of the story, there is no price for kindness, and yet it goes farther than we could ever imagine. Too often people come to church and get judged because they are different, when church should be the safe place for them to be when they are having a rough go on life. Always be like Christ and show kindness and give hope whenever possible, because we have no idea what God could do in their life with it. And you think about this, 
How many times have we said to ourselves, well, there's this person and they look like they're hurting or they could use some help, but I'm, I'm too busy. I don't have time for that. I have to go get ready so I can watch a football game this afternoon. Or I have to go do whatever it is, go to work, go to a sporting event, go see family. And we're missing why God put us here on earth. He put us here. He left us here to grow and to tell others and to share what we have learned, the knowledge that we have gained from being that stronger Christian. But we are too busy. We are too self-centered to take time out of our day to go and help others, to go enjoy the company of them with the tasks that they have and the struggles that they are going through. We need to remember the promises in Scripture that encourage us to give us hope to live for Christ and comfort us when we are going through hard times in life. One of my favorite promises is a few chapters back in Romans 8.28 where it says, All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. Now this truth was brought out to me by one of my friends and it was really made it really became a part of my life in my teen years. As I don't know how many of you know, but in 2018, my mom died of cancer. And I was going through some pretty hard times. I was really struggling, asking God why, really questioning God. And then it was just, I mean, I was just kind of just getting by there, but not really there in any other aspects. And then I read, one of my friends challenged me to read Romans 8. And you get to verse 28, and it says, But God works all things together for good to them who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And at first, I didn't really um, bother that. I mean, I've seen it in... Then looking back as I meditated on it and kept coming back to that passage, I thought to myself, how could God use cancer for good? How can God use death for good? And we can see from Scripture how God used death for good because if Jesus didn't go to the cross and die for us, we would have no hope for the future. We would just be here living life, doing and then when we die, we would just be done. There would be no afterlife, no eternity, nowhere to go but down. But this truth became real to me when I learned that in that verse, it says all things work together for good, it could be translated, all things work together for us to become like Christ. And when we look at life, when we look at Scripture, and we look at our circumstances and say, how am I going to become more like Christ through this crisis or this trial that God has me in right now? How is this going to benefit me for the future? And now, five, five and a half years later, looking back on that crisis in my life, I see how God used that for good in my life. Because in high school, I was really living for me in basketball. That's all I cared about. I just wanted to play basketball and not have to worry about anything else in life. But God used that verse to get me into a Christian school. He used that verse to help me grow. In and he, ultimately, he helped me. He helped me through that crisis to go to Faith Baptist Bible College where I am now studying to become a youth pastor. And just think that if that cancer didn't come into my mom's life, if my mom didn't die, these things might, I might not be where I am. Who knows where I'd be? I mean, I look at some of the friends I had in high school and where they are now. I mean, it it's just scary to think of where we could be if we didn't have Christ and if we weren't growing 
and if we didn't have other Christians encouraging us to live for Christ. And moving on as we get to verses 5 and 6, we see the fourth principle from this passage. In verse 5, the Bible says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with, God, with Christ Jesus, that together ye may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So our fourth principle we see from this text is we need to show Christ by learning to glorify God together. What, what has God called you to endure as you have been striving to live for Him? What is He calling you to endure right now? The practice of defining spiritual unity is simple to define. To live in harmony with one another. Because that is what these verses are saying. They're saying we need to live together as a body, as a church. Because that is when we will have the most impact. This truth is so simple to say, yet it is so hard to live. I have heard or read about all kinds of different churches sitting over little things like where to put the piano, or if we can use guitars and worship, and so on. But here in verse 5, we are commanded to live in harmony together. When Paul wrote this, he was talking about Gentile and Jewish Christians arguing over what holidays to celebrate, what food to eat, and if they could eat meat with one that was sacrificed to idols. But for us today, we argue about what clothes we should wear to church, or what music we can listen to, and so on. And going back to when Paul wrote this, you have to realize that this was right after Christ came, and the Jews were still stuck in their old ways of Judaism and sacrifices and holidays and in the law. But the Gentiles, they didn't know any of this. They were kind of shut out from the Jewish traditions. But Christ came and he opened up the gospel to everyone. So the Gentiles, the non-Jews, they were, they, I feel like they were living a lot and doing a lot of the same things we would be doing today. But the Jews were still stuck on all these old ways and practices and traditions and it was causing a lot of problems in the churches in Rome. So here Paul is saying that we need to endure, we need to give up ourselves for the benefits of others. And I think we need to get a better understanding of what Scripture says in Romans 14, verse 13, where the Bible says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hinder in the way of a brother. So I think a good guide for life, a good guide to base decisions off of is, is what you're doing, the music you're listening to, the places you go, the way you talk, is that going to cause another Christian brother or sister to stumble? Is that going to drag them down or is that going to build them up? And if we could gauge our thinking and all of our actions by that standard, I think we would regret our decisions a lot less than we do. So I find myself all the time making sarcastic comments or whatever. And then after I say it, I think about it, and I'm like, well, I probably shouldn't have said that. That, that could have been very hurtful to that person. Or this person over here that's struggling with a different area in life, they could hear that and, be, and think, oh, I guess that doesn't really matter. Or even the music you listen to. As listen to worship music, but what do we listen to the rest of the week? 
Is it glorifying God? And then the people we work with and are in the workplaces or wherever we are, is that is that affecting their view on Christians? Is that affecting the way they see Christ? And as many of you know, I am a basketball player. And when my team is playing a game and there is one guy on the team with a bad attitude or doesn't put the team first in his actions, it brings the whole team down. It ruins the ability to play together the way a team is supposed to play. And everyone watching can see it happening. And it normally ends in a loss for the team that quits playing as a team. All it takes is one guy or one player to get the whole team's focus out of line. And in a lot of ways, it is the same with the body of Christ. If one part of the body, if one person isn't doing what they should be doing, it's working it is not, the body will not work properly and it will affect all the rest of the people who are part of the body. So we need to put aside our differences and realign our focus to get our focus back on Christ where it needs to be. Because we can do way more when everyone is doing what they are good at together than we could than we could do when everyone is trying to do their own things by themselves. There is an old saying which says, many hands make light work. Just as this is true to get a job done, this is also true when it comes to serve Jesus as Christians. Now in this saying, many hands make light work, was um, first brought up to me. It was an older lady at church back home who would come over and she would teach us piano lessons and then she would help out my mom around the house. And almost every time she would use that and say, okay, let's do the dishes. And many hands may like work. Or let's weed the garden. Which growing up, that are two jobs I did not want to do. <laughs> but you can see that principle in so many things. You see how the dishes get done a lot faster when there's four people instead of one. Or the garden gets weeded a lot faster when everybody's there instead of just your mom or this nice old lady, <laughs> as it was for me. But that's also true in churches. That's also true in the body of Christ. How, yeah, these, we can, there's people who are just great. Like, they, they're always out soul winning. There's always out talking to people, encouraging people, making people think. But that person can't be teaching Sunday school, can't be preaching, can't be leading music, playing the piano, and doing everything at the same time. That's why we need a church family. That's why we need to work together. Because how many more people can be reached when there's a body? Like, you can read in other places in Scripture where Paul says, Can the eye say to the hand, I have no need for you? And we need to be working together because when we are together with the same focus, with a similar focus, which is, should be to honor Christ and bring glory to God, we can accomplish way more. And glorifying God should be our number one priority in our lives. But too many times we let our selfish hearts get in the way and distract us from what God made us to do. Let's change our focus today. Think about this. What have you been doing to encourage your weaker brothers, the weaker Christians around you? Are you looking for ways to encourage them and go out of your way to help them? Are you just doing enough to get by, doing what's convenient for you, so you don't have to sacrifice anything? Are, are we being examples of Christ in every action we do in life? Because someone is always watching you, whether it's at work or your home, Wherever it is, someone's always watching, and they're going to get 
their view of Christ and Christians is going to be shaped from your actions. And what are we learning from others' mistakes that have gone before us? Are we studying history not just so we have knowledge, we don't repeat it and make the same mistakes? There's an old saying that goes, an ounce of cure is, an uh, ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. And are we seeking to glorify God in every action we commit in our day-to-day -day life? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you now, and we thank you for this opportunity to look into your word and to dive in and see what you have for us. And I pray that you would help us to take these truths and to apply them to our lives so that we can become more like Christ in the way we live, talk, and think. And I pray that we would just honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. The song, we'll sing the chorus on the last um, last verse, we'll sing the chorus, and then we'll repeat the chorus. I don't think it's in the slides, but we'll repeat the chorus again a cappella. But we'll sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. Sing that again. 
He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. You are dismissed.